Hello and welcome to Louis Phillips in Pursuit of Excellence. My guest today is arguably India's greatest ever badminton champion. Of course, a Padma Award winner and the first Indian winner of the All England Championships in England. Prakash, great to see you. Same here. Uh, you look uh, like you could get back on court again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. You look fit. You you, you keep playing still? Uh, I play a little squash just to keep fit. Go to the gym once or twice. Uh, got to be careful now. So, <laughs> can't do it day in and day out. But I try to manage. Fantastic. I, I have to uh, take you back in time a little bit because uh, we, we talked about this before. Well, we played badminton way back when. We won't mention the year, yeah. just to be <laughs> just to be right. But uh, do you remember the time when of we course, played badminton way back? We played uh, the interstate uh, in Belgium. Like, okay, I, I won't mention the year. <laughs> uh, I still remember. I think you were equally good. Uh, <laughs> Very kind. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a good time because I think that uh, uh, obviously that time you were talking about getting into badminton full time and. Uh, you know, I couldn't make up my mind. And of course, once I saw you playing, I decided to go to some other sport. No, not really. I think you were uh, quite good in badminton as well. You know, if you had continued, I'm sure uh, you could have done well. But I think I was just coming up at that time. I, um, I think I was still a junior. Yeah. Um, I think initially I started, uh, you know, not with the intention of becoming a champion. You know, I just loved the game, just as you love tennis. And, you know, uh, so my father used to play the sport. So, you know, that's how I just uh, started playing, you know, in a, in a ma- marriage hall. A very small marriage hall. Uh, uh, we could play only six months in a year whenever there were no weddings. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how popular badminton was in those days, in the 60s. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, at that time, uh, as tennis was as well, you know, I, I suppose people asked your parents, you know, why are you practicing so hard? What is badminton going to do for you? What were your responses at the time? No, I think it was just the passion, you know, we never thought of, uh, you know, what the game would uh, give us in return, you know, we loved the game so much, uh, we never thought of, you know, future or, you know, making a career out of it, uh, I think, you know, that came uh, much later, um, you know, we liked the game so much, so whenever we got an opportunity, me and my brother and a couple of other youngsters, uh, you know, would, uh, as soon as we get an opportunity, we would go and uh, play the uh, play the sport, you know, in, in a small uh, club in Maleshwaram. So I think it was just the passion and love for the sport and nothing else. And whatever happened later on, you know, it was just, uh, it was it was a bonus. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, I think when you look at something like that, how, did you have a problem with uh, sort of managing both school academics and, uh, and doing badminton as well? Uh, no, not really. I think we were able to manage, uh, you know, it was, uh, the, like I mentioned, you know, the game was not very popular, you know, in India at that time, you know, in the 60s and even 70s. Yeah. So there was a season, you know, like uh, we had to play for uh, maybe six months in a year and the remaining six months you could uh, always, uh, you know, make up your uh, academics. So I, I think I was able to manage both. Uh, you know, I was uh, fairly good in studies also. <laughs> uh, of course, I couldn't take up any uh, professional course, you know, like engineering or medicine, but... Uh, I, you know, finished my graduation. Uh, whenever I was in town, I made it a point to attend the classes regularly, didn't miss. Uh, you know, I would go for my uh, physical training in the mornings, then attend school or college, and then come back and train in the evenings. And whenever I was in town, you know, like I mentioned, uh, there were not so many tournaments throughout the year as it is now. So I think that was a big help. We played a lot of tournaments, but whenever I was in town, uh, made it a point to uh, attend the classes regularly. And, at you know, take at what time would you say that... Uh, you know, you decided, I I want to do this uh, even more. Uh, Passion has driven me to a point where I really would like to be India's number one or win the national championships and so on. Um, I think when I won the uh, junior uh, and senior title together at the age of 16. So that was when I realized, uh, you know, that I had, you know, some something extra, you know, because uh, at 16, I won the junior and the senior in the same year. So, you know, I decided that, uh, I think this was the time when, you know, I, I, I took it up seriously, you know, then um, I, I thought uh, I should put in a little more effort and try to do, I didn't know where I would reach, you know, I wanted to uh, to be the best, wanted to win the All England, um, you know, but at that time, I think it, I was not, never sure whether I could do it because, uh, uh, you know, nobody from India had done it and we were not a force to reckon with in, in world badminton, you know, there were countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Korea, Denmark. So people were, uh, you know, people like Nandu Natekar had uh, done reasonably well, but uh, they had not won any big event. So, you know, I decided that, you know, I'll give my, you know, 100%, put in my 100% effort 
uh, try to do as much as possible and you know try to reach whatever uh, try to reach my potential i think that was uh, my intention i was not sure whether i could do it but uh, whatever i decided was you know I, to put in 100% effort in in all my training sessions i mean when you look back at uh, badminton at that time and the, and the great indian players of of that era uh, natekar and uh, Dinesh Khanna yeah, and uh, Suresh, Suresh Goel yeah. and, and all of them. Uh, w- what was the difference that uh, made you kind of grow out of their shadow? Um, see, like in any other sport, you know, uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was more of strokes. Uh, you know, it was more about, uh, uh, you know, touch touch badminton. I think it was Rudy Hartono in the early 70s uh, who changed the face of Indian badminton. He turned it into a power badminton. And luckily, I got a chance to play against him, uh, you know, in Bombay Jim Khanna. at the age of 15 you know in the very first round they had an international event you know in those days they used to have international matches in bombay uh, you know they used to call some of the uh, world leading players so i got a chance to play with him and of course i lost 15 5 15 3 you know we couldn't score uh, more than 5 points but that one match was uh, you know uh, gave me a lot of insight into what actually uh, badminton needed it had become a power sport Uh, it had become a fitness sport so it was not enough if you were just good 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 in your game you had to you know physically be fit you had to be strong you know there were a lot of other uh, things so i went and talked to him talked to his coach that was when i realized that you know uh, i had to put in a lot more effort uh, uh, you know if i had to make a mark at the world level uh, so i would still consider you know as a junior you know that one match which i played i think was uh, was a real eye opener for me So up until then you really didn't quite have a full indication as to what world badminton was like. Yeah, it no, was nothing, more nothing. very much local and domestic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, you know I've also just uh, learned watching because you know there were no video, there were no internet, there was uh, you know nothing, no books. So, you know we had to watch players uh, live, you know like when I started, you know some state players were playing there, then when you started representing the state, you would watch the national players. So it's been basically just watching and learning. there was no other way you know to get to the next level uh, we didn't have uh, you know expert coaches uh, in the south in those days so it's been basically uh, watching and uh, uh, also you know more of trial and error uh, kind of training what would you say was your biggest sort of driving force what made you sort of reach for that impossible because at that point in time we don't know as we were growing up it was a similar issue of not knowing what the world held for you so what was the driving force there to be able to reach for that um well i think it was just the uh, i just wanted to challenge myself wanted to see you know what i was capable of um uh, basically you know try to reach my potential i think that was uh, you know i did not play to please anybody i did not please to play my parents or you know my employers or my college or my you know government or i just wanted to see what i was capable of you know so that kept me going uh, i decided that uh, you know every s- training session i attend i will put in my 100% effort and uh, you know leave the rest you know whatever i was capable of so you know, at the end of uh, the you know at the end of my career you know right now i have no regrets because uh, i know that you know whatever i could do whatever was in my hands i have you know put in the full effort and uh, i couldn't have done anything more under the circumstances so i have absolutely no regrets of uh, you know uh, not having i think that's what uh, kept me going um, even though i didn't know you know what the future was but i mean you're young you're growing up you know in your mid teens late teens and so on you're already national champion i mean how do you uh, you know there are a lot of dis- distractions you know variety of attractions come your way distractions as well uh parents telling you one thing and academics is another issue and how did you cope with all of that if 16 years old you were national champion um no luckily i think uh, you know we like the sport so much um and uh, i think one of the things was you know there were not so many distractions as as we have now so i think that was a, a big plus point um and especially staying in bangalore uh, you know uh, it was not as big a city as bombay or delhi or um also i think you know a passion for the sport uh, we had to i realized very quickly you know at the age of 16 that if i had to make a mark you have to make some sacrifices you can't have both you know you can't be partying you can't be having late nights and at the same time hope to do well at the international level so i think i realized uh, pretty quickly so i i won't call it a sacrifice you know because i liked it so almost for you know like 15 years or so during my uh, you know i've almost like every day uh, during the weekdays you know i've uh, slept at 10 woken up at uh, uh, 
5, 5.30 or 6 in the morning for uh, going my, doing my training. But I never complained because you know, I enjoyed it so much. So I think that's what uh, you know, kept me driving. <laughs> I'm not quite sure the viewers watching this, especially the young viewers, would completely agree with you on going to bed at 10 and waking up at 5. <laughs> Right to be able to put that sacrifice element into the. Into no, the I think mix. I think in those days, you know, it was not just yeah. me. I'm sure you know most of the athletes or uh, you know people who have to you know make a mark. I think they have sacrificed uh, a lot because, like I mentioned, you know you can't have both. I'm sure uh, you know uh, even other athletes like Milka Singh or whoever has excelled at the highest level, they've had to make uh, some sacrifices. You cannot you know you know attend social events. You cannot have. Uh, you know, be uh, attending all parties and then, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, do well uh, internationally, you know. Nationally, of course, it may be possible, but uh, if one has to, um, you know, in, excel in any field, yeah. I think one has to uh, make some sacrifices. Now, okay, so you ended up winning the national championships, was India's best player, obviously a great potential. People are all, all looking to you now to to do better and to be able to excel and uh, and all of that. So, to go from national level badminton to international level is a huge jump. I mean, you've you've got so many things to think about and things that you don't know. So, how did you start to focus on something like that? Well, again, uh, I think uh, there was another uh, event which you know again was the turning point of my career. Um, I was the national champion for seven years. You know, so from sixteen to twenty three. Um, you know, I, I won the national seven times, but didn't do anything significantly at the international level. It was not because, you know, uh, it was not due to lack of effort, but basically I didn't know what to do. You know, we hardly got uh, an opportunity to go out, maybe two tournaments in a year. So whatever I knew I would, you know, uh, do. But in 1976, when I was, I think, uh, you know, 21, 22, I got an opportunity to train, uh, go and train with the Indonesians uh, for six weeks. And I would consider that as one of the turning points of my career. You know, I played with the national team, you know, Rudy Hartono, Lim Swee King, Christian Adinata, the best Chun Chun. They were the world number one at uh, that time. And, uh, uh, you know, I learned so much from that one trip, you know, especially the physical training part. But what, what made you go there? I mean, did you think that you had to go someplace outside of India to base yourself like perhaps tennis does with Barcelona today or Florida? Yeah. You, you had to go there. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, I was, I, I was working for a bank at that time and, you know, the, uh, the MD asked me, you know, uh, you're doing well at the national level. Why, why have not, uh, uh, you know, uh, excelling the at, the, uh, at the international level? So I said, you know, I'm trying whatever I can. I, I'm doing whatever, you know, putting in my best effort. So he says, you know, what, what, what do you think can we do? I said, I don't know, but maybe if I go to Indonesia and train, and it, it, it was, it had never been done before. So I was not sure whether it would happen. So I said, you know, that's a chance we have to take. So we just wrote to them and they said, okay, you come. So I think that was again a turning point. And I learned so much from that trip, the physical training. Uh, so when I came back, that was for six weeks. I played with, you know, all the, the best players. So when I first went, you know, the first week, you know, I would get three points or five points, not more than four or five points. But at the end of the you know, six weeks, you know, I had started beating them. So I, you know, because I would train with them, whatever they did, I, you know, followed, uh, you know, me and Syed Modi, both of us went uh, for this trip. So was there any, was there anything that uh, you felt you were missing here that you picked up there besides the fact that obviously they had a technique and they had the training methods and it so on? It was not, not so much to do with the game, but it was more to do with the physical training. We were, we, we didn't know, we had absolutely no idea about physical training. It was so scientific, you know, there were different things they were doing to improve, you know, like endurance, they were doing one thing. For uh, uh, footwork, they would do another thing. For strength, they would do another thing. For, uh, you know, flexibility, they would do another thing. Of course, nowadays, you know, everybody yes. knows. But in the 70s, you yes. know, we didn't know anything because physical fitness was not known at all uh, in, in those days, especially in India. So I learned so much about the physical fitness aspect. So that was what was lacking in my game. Technically, of course, uh, you know, I was, I think, uh, on par with them. Not, uh, you know, uh, I had some strength. They had their own strengths. But physical fitness, I think I was uh, way, uh, way below. So I noted down what all they were doing, you know, like Monday to Saturday, they would, you know, do different things on different days, you know, how many sets and how many repetitions came back, followed exactly the same uh, pattern, pattern, you know, on Monday, whatever we were doing there to the extent possible, you know. And then within six months, uh, you know, I won the Commonwealth Games, you know, and then went on to uh, win the first uh, prize money tournament in badminton. And, you know, I think 
from the rest of history. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have the Indonesians working with someone like yourself and they know fully well that you're going to be a real major competitor for them down the road. No, I think that time they didn't expect because, you know, Indians, uh, they had not, uh, nobody from India had, had, made uh, uh, had made it yet. So, in fact, I was told that, you know, after, you know, my going there, they've stopped taking any foreigners <laughs> in the national camps at least. You know, people go to different clubs, yeah. but, uh, you know, they're not allowed to train with the national teams. Was there anything specific about the Indonesians and the Malaysians that kind of separated them from us, besides the fact that they were perhaps more suited to playing badminton or obviously very athletic and, yeah. and very light on their feet and so on? Uh, were we a little bit more sort of uh, flat-footed, less agile? That kind of thing? No, I think they have the strength. We have our own strength, you know, like uh, they were more physical, you know, they, they were faster, they were fitter, you know, they would, they were stronger. Whereas we had, uh, you know, our own strength, you know, like uh, we were good in deception. Uh, you know, I think tactically we were much better, more to do with the mind. So, you know, what I did was I came up with a style of my own. I did not completely, you know, change my game and started playing exactly like them. I kept the strengths, you know, whatever we, our strengths we had, like deception. Yes. You know, wrist, we were very, we had very good wrists. You know, the Indians generally have a very good wrist. So we have a good control over the shuttle. So I kept all those and, uh, you know, took the good points from their game and, you know, included in my game and came up with a style of my own. So I think that uh, gave me the, uh, you know, the, the best results. And in fact, if I had tried to follow, you know, exactly the way they were playing, I don't think I would have been so successful. So you went on and uh, the late 70s came about and then the late 70s and early 80s, where your best time in badminton was best time for Indian badminton. Um, I remember playing Wimbledon at the same time you were winning the All England at uh, in, at Wembley. But uh, just take us through that those moments because you won the Danish Championship, the Swedish Open, and all of those Scandinavian events as well. But when you came into that All England Championships that year, did you feel that uh, now this is my moment, I can win, or am I one of the challengers, one of the favourites for this tournament? Um, no, I, uh, frankly speaking, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, I had expected that I'll win. But, uh, you know, I was in good form. Uh, you know, it was, I first played the Danish Open in March 1980. I won that, then played the Swedish Open. I won, you know, most of all the matches I won in straight games. So I knew that I was in good, good form. And, uh, but Lim speaking, who was the defending champion, didn't play in these two tournaments to conserve himself for the All England. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went for the All England and, uh, you know, I was feeling good. So, but still I was not sure whether I could win the title. But I decided that, you know, I'll, uh, you know, put in my best effort. And I'd probably played, uh, limb speaking, maybe three or four times before that. And I'd never beaten him. And luckily, again, I was in good form. So we both reached the finals. Uh, you know, I didn't drop a game. But uh, again, in the finals, uh, I decided that, you know, I'll um, give him a tough fight. I'll not uh, give up. Um, and I felt good, you know, when we re uh, when I just knocked before the finals. Uh, so I knew that, uh, you know, this time it, it could be now, you know. So, and uh, I had a strategy in place. Uh, you know, I, uh, basically he was much faster than me. So I decided to slow him down a little bit, keep him, uh, you know, more at the on the baseline. And I had to get my length right because, you know, he had a very powerful smash. So I had to keep him, you know, more uh, at the back. And uh, using my deception, I slowed his game down, and uh, I think that really worked. And you know, I I won the uh, the finals uh, also in straight games. So I think uh, that was definitely one of the turning points, uh, not just you know in my career, but I think also for Indian badminton. Oh, absolutely, no question about it. For Indian sport in general, that was a huge turning point. But when you look at that match, uh, what do you take away from something like that? Is it a question of uh, you know it's it, Often you get to a match where you, where you play close matches, but don't close it out. You know, so you, uh, for an athlete, that's the biggest bugbear. You know, when we say in tennis, serving for a set is the time you lose your serve. Serving for the match is the time you lose your serve. But, you know, when you were closing out that match, knowing it's the biggest title you're ever going to win, and it was a dream that was going to come true, uh, tenseness, pressure... No, pressure and tenseness will always be there. But I think within the first few points, uh, you know, I'd gotten over it. I, I was focusing so much on, you know, uh, concentrated on getting one point at a time. Didn't really, um, you know, think of winning. Even when I was, you know, leading match point. Uh, maybe I was, I was, I was, you know, very focused. So didn't really, you know, think that I was just one point away or, you know, it, I played as if 
uh, you know, I was beginning uh, playing the first few points of the match. So I think I was in a you know very uh, good frame of mind. So psych psychologically also I was very confident because I trained hard. So uh, even though at the beginning of the match uh, I was a little tense, but I think very quickly I had gotten over it, and uh, you know didn't bother me uh, you know till uh, I won the title. <laughs> and I, I guess the elation after the winning the title must have been unbelievable because obviously the first Indian to win it and uh, to win such a major championships and uh, to win it at a young age to to know that you are turning badminton on its head now in India. Um, what was it like afterwards? Because there must have been immense pressure on you as All England champion to travel the world and everyone's expecting you to win now. Um, no, in fact, uh, I was personally very happy, you know, that I, I could achieve my dream of winning. But I never expected, uh, you know, the uh, to get the kind of reception which I got when I came back home. Because badminton was a very, uh, you know, a minor sport, a very not so popular but I didn't expect that, you know, there was so much coverage here because there was no TV in those days. So it was all radio. newspaper and uh, radio. So yes. people, so when I landed in Bombay and then came to Bangalore, you know, the kind of reception which I got, I think I was overwhelmed. I never expected that, you know, anything like that uh, would happen. And uh, But, uh, you know, like you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, I realized that uh, winning the title for the first time is much easier. Uh, but to remain there, I think, uh, requires a lot more effort. Uh, so it was definitely a lot more pressure, you know, later on after that, because uh, you know earlier when you had not won the All England, if you reached the quarterfinals or semi-finals, maybe people would still be happy, you know, at least he's made it to the quarters or semis. But once you, you know, set a benchmark and you have won, even if you lose in the finals, you know, it's still not good enough. You know, people say, you know, his game has gone down. So that kind of, you know, puts uh, pressure. But I think, you know, the, the, uh, you need to work hard. Uh, I think it's a different kind of pressure. One one needs to learn to uh, to cope up with uh, you know such kind of pressure if one has to uh, remain on the top. But I think it's been a uh, it's been a worthwhile journey and uh, it's been a very satisfying uh, career for me. Well, the, the 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 term itself, you know, All England champion, you know, means a lot. Obviously, Prakash, that's just a remarkable story about winning the All England championships. But when you go back, how do you maintain that level? Uh, well, I really had to work hard. Uh, you know, luckily also, just after the All England, I got an opportunity to uh, to become a professional and you know move to Denmark. I think that was again another uh, turning point of my career. Uh, I used to play for a club, even though I uh, continued representing India in the, in the major international tournaments. But uh, uh, you know, I think uh, because I'd reached a stage where uh, you know I could completely focus only on my game. I had a professional manager. You know, in those days would look after all my other, you know, my travel, my visas and other things. And I would only focus on uh, playing. So I think that helped me a lot. You know, my shift to Denmark for six years, I played a lot with uh, Morten Frost and, you know, a lot of the other Danish players. Uh, I stayed there, uh, uh, you know, for about between uh, December 1980 and December 1986. I think that helped me a lot uh, to remain on the top uh, for, a, for a long time. Uh, was it uh, it's something that was obviously unique at the time in sport to be a professional badminton player? How was it looked upon in India at the time? Um, well, in fact, uh, my parents were very much against it. Uh, you know, coming from a uh, fairly middle class family and I was working for a bank like I mentioned. And when I won the Commonwealth Games and the All England, I had got two promotions. So I was quite high up in, in, the, uh, in, the, bank. in the bank. Uh, <laughs> and initially, you know, I got an offer for a one year contract. So, you know, my parents, uh, you know, were very conservative. So, he says, what will you do? You got such a good job, you know, like government job and you got two <laughs> promotions. You're, you know, so senior. Yes. Why do you want to take a risk? And, you know, yes. uh, I said, no, if I have to uh, continue playing and if I have to remain on the top, I have to take that risk. Um, but what will you do after one year? I said, after one year, we'll see. I don't know what my, you know, what I'll do. So, I think it was a big risk which I took. Uh, but, you know, luckily I, I played well, uh, you know, they kept extending my contract and uh, so I uh, stayed there for six years. And I think that, uh, again, you know, helped me, like I mentioned, uh, to remain on the top for, uh, for quite some time. Long. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which, Which would a... probably not have been possible if I had stayed back in India. Not because, uh, you know, even though I won the All England year, you know, after you reach, you know, like you become the world number one or, you know, you, won, you win the All England, 
uh, you need a different kind of focus. You know, I, I would have spent a lot of time, uh, especially in those days, you know, doing a lot of other things because you know how the federations work in in India. So I would have to do everything myself. You know, that my travel arrangements and you know. To even send entries or uh, you know to get a phone call, it was it, all those a lot of other issues were there. <laughs> the usual, <laughs> the usual issues of, of the 70s and 80s. So I would have spent a lot of time off the court, you know, yes. you know, taking care of all the other things. And for everything, we had to go to Delhi for clearances, and so all these issues were not there, you know, because I shifted to Denmark. Uh, so in, again, I have absolutely no regrets of uh, having uh, made that move. So okay, so now you finally. Uh, hung up your badminton racket. Did you ever, when you hung it up, did you think uh, I could give it two more years, or were you done? No, I, I, not even once. You know, have I felt uh, I retired at when I was 33. You know, in uh, 1988, I, uh, I think first, like I mentioned, at 15, I won the national junior. So I, I had a fairly long innings, and uh, you know, I put in my heart and soul into the sport. Uh, I was very focused. Uh, I made a lot of sacrifices, so I never felt, you know, I had taken a long, uh, long time to decide, you know, uh, maybe from 30 or 31, one or two years I dragged and uh, it was not so much the physical strain, you know, mentally also it becomes very tiring, you know, when you're not able to, when you've reached, when you achieved something, you know, I could have still played for the country, you know, probably been the national champion, but that does not give you the same kind of satisfaction when you've you know, done well at the world level. Uh, so, you know, that's when I decided, uh, so I, I have absolutely, again, no regrets uh, and not, not even once have I felt, uh, you know, that uh, that I should have, you know, I, I want to come back. So I think I had given given it, uh, you know, my, my best effort. So Prakash Padukone Badminton Academy that uh, you launched thereafter. And uh, now you're just talking about it off camera here and you mentioned it's nearly 20 years now for the Academy. It's, it's unbelievable. Year. It's just yeah. flown by. But um, what made you want to start it? Did you feel that you could impart your experience and your knowledge to the next generation? Yeah, basically, in fact, Vijay, it was, uh, you know, I got uh, inspired by your uh, Britannia Amritraj Tennis Academy, which you started in uh, Chennai. I think that was the, one of the first privately sponsored, uh, you know, in Indian sport. Uh, I think, you know, in the 90s, uh, or maybe it was in the 80s, uh, it was not easy to get uh, corporate sponsorship. You know, everything was government funded. Yes. So, you know, I, like I mentioned, you know, I had gone through a lot of hardships, uh, you know, coming up, uh, you know, without absolutely any facilities. So I didn't want the present generation, you know, the play players who were playing at that time uh, to go through the same kind of hardships. So what I tried to do was, uh, you know, started the academy with sponsorship. And, uh, you know, it was completely funded by these sponsors. And we made sure that whatever hardships, you know, I had gone through, you know, the present generation or the trainees who were in the academy, you know, did not have to go through the same, you know, they had the best uh, uh, infrastructure, they had the best equipment, the best coaches, best international exposure, you know, um, good contracts, everything, you know, whatever I did not have as a youngster. So that was basically the idea behind it. It was more of a center of excellence. It was not so much a commercial uh, venture, you know, to, to make money or it was more to give back to the game. And, uh, uh, you know, I was able to do it uh, you know, like you did in tennis uh, with corporate sponsorship, which was unheard of in badminton in the, uh, you know, in the 90s. Of course, nowadays, it's, it's much easier to get uh, corporate sponsorship because there's a lot more awareness. But in those days, uh, it, it was quite tough. But again, you know, it's been a very satisfying experience because uh, we made sure that, you know, the trainees who uh, came out of the academy, uh, you know, had everything. So we basically provided a platform for them to excel. And, uh, you know, we made sure that, you know, they had the best of facilities. And if anybody who came out of the academy, if they said, uh, you know, I, I did not get the best facilities, you know, then I, I'm, I'm sure they are lying. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, basically it was, you know, there's a platform. It's, it's up to you to make use of. Uh, uh, do, you the, feel, the, do you feel that there's a strong commitment from the, from the boys and girls now in your academy that they can actually make use of all that you're offering them? Yes, I think, uh, you know, discipline, dedication, and, you know, that probably sometimes we give more importance to that more than the talent itself. We've been, you know, uh, very consistent with that right from day one. And I think it, it has paid off because, uh, you know, we've realized that, you know, also from my own experience, and I've seen so many players, you know, who are very talented, but not so disciplined, you know, have not reached the potential. And even one player, you know, if he's not disciplined or, you know, is just fooling around, can influence a lot of other uh, players in, in the, you know, in the camp. So we give a lot of emphasis uh, on, uh, you know, dedication and discipline. They have to be very focused. 
um, in fact, I would rather train uh, a less talented player who's disciplined rather than a talented player who's not so disciplined. That's been our motto. Well, hard work and process. overcome talent, lack of talent, but not the other way around. Yes, very true. Where do you see your academy 10 years from now? Well, I think uh, I've not really thought about it. <laughs> Uh, obviously, we would like to, you know, produce uh, Olympic champions, uh, you know, possible, uh, you know, because the whole intention is, you know, not to create national champions, you know, the kind of effort, the kind of money we spend, the kind of, um, um, you know, the talent we have. So, you know, all this put together, you know, I would not be satisfied if, you know, we produce national champions or even Asian, Asian Games gold medal or, uh, of course, the aim would be to, you know, if, if somebody can go on to win the Olympic gold, you know, not even Olympic bronze or a silver, you know, I want somebody to win a... Olympic gold in badminton, whether they are from my academy or from, uh, you know, from you know, any other academy, it doesn't really matter. You know, as long as an Indian uh, badminton player wins, I think that would be my, uh, you know, uh, a long-term goal. Uh, and in whatever way I can contribute, I would uh, definitely be, uh, you know, willing to help. Incredible changes since the time you obviously won the All England and the time you started playing badminton. Um, badminton is a well-respected sport now in India. You have the badminton league now. You have so many academies. You have so much more interest in it, more corporate sponsorships, television coverage, and so on and so forth. Uh, has badminton grown across the board at the grassroots level as well? Yes, I think so. You know, especially in the last, I think, three or, three or four years, you know, especially from 2010, um, I think there's been an all-round development. We can see it, uh, you know, more courts are coming up, more youngsters are playing. We can see it in the number of entries we get when we have All India tournaments. Uh, even at the, you know, club level, uh, you know, people are playing the sport just for fitness. I think it's got a lot to do with, uh, uh, you know, media coverage and also Saina and Sindhu, you know, the players are doing well and, uh, you know, badminton league, a lot of factors put together. So I think on the whole, uh, Indian badminton is definitely uh, looking up. A lot of talent. Uh, of course, we need more academies. You know, uh, things are uh, moving very slowly, but uh, I think government is also helping uh, helping a lot. But you know, even the federation, if they are a little more proactive, and if we get uh, you know the right kind of people in the federation with with uh, you know vision, who can plan for the next five to ten years, because I definitely see a lot of talent. You know, uh, even from a very young age. You know, people as young as six or seven. You know, so many good players. I don't know whether everybody gets an opportunity to to excel themselves, but uh, there's definitely a lot of talent, and uh, you know we can become like another Indonesia of the you know 80s and the 90s or you know what what China is. But we need to organize ourselves a little better. Uh, you know, if we work hard, uh, every possibility that uh, you know Indian badminton uh, definitely a bright future for Indian badminton. I mean, I think you've explained it pretty much during our conversation. But uh, if you had something to tell youngsters today who are watching the show, what would be your, what would be your theme to tell them, uh, uh, someone, someone who had a dream to be a badminton champion at a time when badminton was nothing, and today it is truly something? Um, well, I think I've you know, pretty much mentioned during the course of the interview, uh, be prepared to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, be patient. I think, you know, patience is one, one thing, you know, like for seven years, you know, I did not do anything at the international level, but I kept it, you know, just kept going. So, you know, sometimes it clicks. So you've got to be patient, you know, these days, I think players and parents, you know, both expect very quick results. You know, they start today and tomorrow they want to be state level, day after they want to be at the national level. So it does not happen like it that. It happens in every sport, I guess. Yeah, I think <laughs> everywhere, probably all walks of life, not yes. just in sport. Yes. Uh, but you've got to be patient. You've got to give yourself time, uh, give 100% in, in every, uh, you know, training session you do. And, uh, you know, try to reach your potential. You know, that's all, uh, that, that's uh, always, uh, you know, I insist. Because everybody cannot become world champions. Everybody cannot win, uh, you know, an Olympic gold medal. But uh, if, you, if you can reach your potential and, you know, at the end of your career, you know, if you have no regrets, you can't do anything more than that. You know, that's been my motto in life, you know, like give you 100% and, uh, you know, let, let uh, you know, life take its uh, course. <laughs> So I think uh, th that would be my advice for uh, for the youngsters as and well. And rightly so, yeah. absolutely. Uh, family time. You have uh, two lovely daughters. Uh, one girl is a superstar in Bollywood. The other girl is on the way to becoming a superstar in golf. Anisha plays great, great golf from what you tell me. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that one of them wanted to be a model and a, and a, and a Bollywood star, which she is, and arguably the best actress on, uh, on Indian soil today. And you've got a second daughter who plays good golf 
Is that something that she would like to pursue and become a professional golfer? Yeah, I think that's what, uh, basically what we've tried to do is, uh, you know, like, um, uh, you know, my father, when I was, uh, when, when I finished my school, you know, he gave me the option to pursue my passion. You know, my elder brother was more into academics, so he, you know, let him choose academics. He said, you do what you want, you know. So I said, you know, I, I want to pursue badminton and do BCom. You know, if I wanted, if he had forced me, you know, again, like in the 70s, you know, all the parents wanted their children to be, to go into either engineering or medicine, you know, to make a career. So if he had forced me into it, I don't know what would have happened, you know. So I, you know, always remembered that and, uh, you know, so we uh, allowed our daughters to pursue their passion. You know, Deepika was always fond of modeling and, uh, you know, she was always uh, wanted to be in the films. More into modeling, actually. I think the films came later on. And, uh, but Anisha, you know, is exactly the opposite. She's, you know, played all sports. So we said, you know, you, you pursue, you work hard. Uh, we are there to support. You have to come up on your own. Uh, so it's entirely in your hands and whatever support we can give, we will. Uh, so we've just, you know, done exactly that. Uh, and, you know, basically I think everybody is happy, you know. Uh, you know, the children are happy because they're pursuing what, uh, what they like, what they enjoy. And, uh, you know, we are there just to support them. That's the theme. Work hard and follow your dreams. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Sure. Prakash, it's absolutely a delight to talk with you. Uh, you have a wonderful family. Thank All you, the very best to you. Always have great memories of that match we played in Belgaum yeah. together. So I'll always remember that. Thanks. Treasure it. Pleasure talking Prakash, to you. Prakash, thanks so much. Sure. Thanks. All the best. Thanks a lot, Vijay.